So, I'm Andrew, and I'm really honored to be here, and I want to share a very personal, kind of vulnerable story about how I came to love birds and how that connects to my passion in biomimicry. And don't worry, I'm going to explain what biomimicry is later on. So in the late 2000s, I was working as a scientist, and I lived in Indianapolis, Indiana. That's where I'm from. And I found myself in a lab a lot of the time, in a sterile environment, sterile lights, sterile social conditions. And so that spurred me to go and spend time out in nature. And one of my favorite places in Indianapolis was called Eagle Creek Park. And one day I was there, minding my own business, just kind of meandering about on this trail. And I stopped, I sat on this stump, and it was a very picturesque and serene moment. There's lush green forest, and there was a single sunbeam emanating through the canopy onto the ground. And all of a sudden, there was this quickening in my spirit, like I wasn't alone in the woods. Then, all of a sudden, there was this whoosh right by my head. And I looked, and there was a terrifying dinosaur, pterodactyl-like bird <laughs> that had landed and perched in the sunbeam and was just glaring at me. And I was terrified because of this giant beak that I was just afraid it was going to poke my eyes out. <laughs> and these large, zygodactyl-like talons that I thought could just grab me and carry me away with. And I was terrified because of all that. My body had a very visceral reaction. I couldn't move. I felt like I was really at the mercy of this beast. And at the same time, I also was filled with awe and wonder at the majesty of this formidable creature. So a moment passes, and it always feels like a dream when I'm recounting this to others. But eventually, and at, to my mercy, it flew away back into the woods. And I rushed home, and I went to the internet, and I just had to know what this thing was. And so I, I knew a couple key characteristics. It had this brilliant, bright crimson crest on the top of its head. And I, I knew the size, so I was looking in field guides. And turns out I'd had a really close encounter with a pileated woodpecker, which I didn't know at the time. Um, it, it was called North America's largest woodpecker, but there are some discrepancies in whether or not the ivory-billed woodpecker still exists and it is or is not extinct. But anyways, this magnificent, beautiful, elegant creature decided to reveal itself to me in the woods. And I felt like I had just interacted with an elder of the forest. <laughs> and it was um, a beautiful moment that completely transformed my life because it made me fall in love with birds. And from that moment, I have sparked in passion, and I have raged in conservation, and I have loved birds, and I have loved nature ever since that moment. And that woodpecker broke a plastic seal that I felt around my life. It, it let the air in, in a way that I didn't know that I needed. And in reflecting, I look back and I see how I was working in this lab. I was living in this house. I was getting in this car and driving on roads, going to another building to work. And nature was tourism to me. And even though I'm a biological being, I have biological needs. I was occupying this world that was denying the biological reality of my existence. I felt like I was being denied what I needed. And I'm forever grateful to that pileated woodpecker for that moment in my life, for shaking me and waking me up to that reality. 
And the balance that I'm trying to have right now is sharing some really serious, some really grave information with uplifting crescendo to the end of my talk. So I would love for you to sit with me in this, to go on this roller coaster with me so that we can get to that uplifting moment at the end. And the more that I learned about birds, the more I learned about these artificial ecosystems that we've constructed, that we inhabit in our daily lives, there's a very staggering statistic to me that says that half of North Americans can go over a week without touching a natural surface. And just think about what this means. I mean, this, this stage is wood, but this is not a natural surface. Think about taking your shoes and socks off, feeling your toes in the soil, in the dirt, getting between your toes. And for some of you, that may be wildly uncomfortable. And I, I want to acknowledge and respect that, and that is a totally valid response to feeling maybe dirty. But there's a beauty and a wonder in nature. And what I've found through bird watching is that there is a great mental health benefit to watching birds. I love going to a new place, studying up on the birds, and experiencing the thrill of being able to identify and know what a bird is before I've seen it. It's a joy that I can't express in words, and I'm not going to attempt to. And the more that I learn about birds, the more that I learn that these artificial ecosystems are increasingly harmful to the planet that we live in. In 2017, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service published data on the top seven anthropogenic causes of bird deaths in the United States alone. And instead of this just being a quick, rudimentary recitation of cold facts, I would love for you to embody this information with me. <sighs> Maybe uh, I invite you to sit in the sadness that I feel from this data. And uh, we're going to start with number seven. Number seven, 200,000 birds a year in the United States are killed by wind turbines. That goes up. Five million birds a year are killed by electrocutions. 25 million birds a year are killed by collisions with power lines. And it keeps going up. 72 million individual birds every year are killed by poisons and harmful man-made chemicals that find their way into the environment. 214 million individual birds every year are killed by collisions with vehicles. And we find ourselves at number two, which is 599 million individual birds in the United States every year are killed by collisions with glass windows. Half of those are skyscrapers 11 stories or taller, but the other half are buildings that are one to three stories tall. And then the number one killer of birds in the US are cats. And most people get that flipped. They think wind turbines because of all of the socio-political talk about them. No, cats, neighborhood cats. <laughs> and they are responsible for 2.4 billion individual bird deaths every year. <sighs> and all of that information, again, just for the United States alone, just every year, that cycle propagates, that ripples out into the environment. And that's a cumulative 3.3 billion birds every year from the top seven anthropogenic causes of bird deaths. And there's more than that. And those numbers are increasing for each of those factors because of issues like light pollution that disturbs migration patterns because humans are living outside of the natural cycles of the sun and the moon, like our ancestors. And 
Those numbers are increasing because of rising habitat loss, habitat demolition, and urban sprawl and growing urbanization, which creates a homogenized environment in which only a few species thrive. And I hesitate, hesitate to say fun fact, but uh, the two most prevalent, two most abundant in terms of the numbers of individuals and the species of birds that exist in the world are house sparrows and European starlings, which if you've ever been lucky enough to be downtown around sunset, there are starling murmurations in downtown Chattanooga. And I catch myself, again, gravitating between awe and disrespect for these animals because of what they represent to me to urbanization and this expansion of human society at the expense of the rest of the environment. And so all of these factors come together. And this intersects with my passion for biomimicry. And I could not be more excited to tell you about biomimicry here. But there are a couple things that I need to explain before that. So biomimicry essentially, and this is going to be a very condensed version, is looking at nature as a model for sustainable and regenerative development. It's looking at how organisms, processes, and systems in nature solve a problem, and then adapting that in a very robust scientific way, applying them to a design context for human designs. And here's why this is important. This is important because biomimicry is this wild and amazing intersection of design and creativity and art and the user experience and the way that communities grow and the way that we as humans interface with the rest of the environment, with the rest of life on Earth. And I found that Arguments of aesthetic and beauty in bird conservation largely fly over people's heads. I mean, we have exotic species, anything you want in nature, piped into our phones at any moment. There is a great devaluation for the natural world. So let's talk about the financial value of birds, because I found that money speaks much louder louder than arguments of aesthetic and beauty. So Clark's nutcracker is a western bird species and in Colorado a study was done and the study was looking at the economic impact of Clark's nutcrackers and if they went extinct. So Clark's nutcrackers are kind of like the chipmunks of birds. They can just stuff their neck, their mouth full of these pine cone seeds and then they go and disperse them around. And a lot of times, they leave some seeds undisturbed and those turn into new trees. So the Clark's Nutcracker has a very important relationship to this white bark pine tree and a few other trees. And it was estimated that this singular bird species, planting this singular tree species, was worth $13.9 billion every year. So it would cost us $13.9 billion to replace this bird spreading this single tree species. And we refer to this as ecosystem services, which that kind of seems like a fancy word, but it just means that we've identified different roles or jobs in nature that organisms fulfill. And so seed dispersal is one of those ecosystem services. Another one would be pest regulation. So eating pests that eat crops. Another economic impact for farmers and for people that are growing food for us. And another really important one is vector control, so controlling diseases. And from 1992 to 2006, in the Andhra Pradesh region in, of India, vultures were increasingly disappearing from the landscape. And this resulted in 48,000 additional human deaths from rabies, and it cost the Indian government $34 billion. 
to handle because they lost vultures, because the vultures were not fulfilling their ecosystem service of regulating the disease vectors. And so one of my points that I want to communicate is that even though we are so isolated from the natural world in these artificial ecosystems, there is this Bluetooth electromagnetic tethering, this intimate linking that humanity has to the rest of the natural world. It goes through concrete, it goes through wood, it goes through brick. We are linked <laughs> to the rest of life on Earth, whether we like that or not. And so my argument is this. We have these facile studies. Are we going to be wise and listen to them? Are we going to hemorrhage money because we cannot adapt to life on Earth like every other species has? And so now, this brings me to the work that I love of biomimicry, which is Biomimicry gives us a way, it's a design methodology and an approach to problem solving that looks to nature as a sustainable model. Janine Banius, who is largely credited with coining the term biomimicry and wrote the modern book on biomimicry, has a quote that says, a sustainable world already exists. And as species on this planet, humans are some of the youngest, the most adolescent, the most infantile in our thinking. And we can look to nature and how it solves problems, and we can apply that to our challenges so that humanity and the rest of life on Earth can thrive hand in hand. And that's the promise of biomimicry, that we can adapt our designs, that we can learn from nature, and we can thrive hand in hand. Instead of humanity existing and getting by at the expense of the environment, of our home. And we're at a really critical moment in the environmental movement and as a species because we are rapidly losing birds, but all of those anthropogenic causes that I listed, those are just birds. That doesn't account for the rest of species that we displace, that we destroy, that we harm because of our presence. And this is the gravest part of my presentation. We're sitting in this, and I think conservationists also have, not to their fault, done a, a poor job of addressing this head on directly and saying, let's feel this and let it spark action from us. And also, individuals, the onus, the gravitas is not solely on us. There are people in charge of corporations that are making decisions that disproportionately outweigh the impact that an individual can make. And I just want to say that out loud so we can breathe a sigh of relief that you don't have to save the world. But as a species, we have got to get our act together. So let me give you an example of how biomimicry, a practical idea of how it can help us in this challenge. So there's a German scientist who was studying spiders one day. And I'm going to give you the abridged Cliff Notes version of this. So he's studying a sp specific spider named an orb weaver, which builds a vertical facing web, kind of like a glass window pane, in between trees. So it's this large space in between trees, and it's building this web. And it weaves a ultraviolet reflective thread into its web. What he found out was that birds can see in the ultraviolet range of light. Humans can't. And so the spider was essentially saying, hey, I'm here. Don't run into me. Because I expended a lot of energy and resources building this web. I worked really hard at it. I'm proud of it. And also, if you run into it, you're just going to get tangled up. It's going to be a mess for everyone. So here's my UV reflective thread communicating and advertising that I'm here. And he was inspired by a spider 
to go back to this glass company, Arnold Glass in Germany, and they created a biomimetic innovation called Ornolux Bird Safe Glass, which is a coating that you can put on windows, and it's also a glass pane innovation that has these UV reflective threads that imitate the spiral structure of spider webs, reflects ultraviolet light, but it doesn't impair the functional work of the window to be transparent. We can't see UV light, so we can see right through the window. So biomimicry is enabling us in this sense to create designs, to build a society that speaks the evolutionary language of the animals that surround it. And this is the promise of biomimicry with green chemistry, with other industrial processes and systems that we can live in harmony with the rest of life on Earth. And if anyone is creative watching this or in this room, I want to challenge you to go out into the world and look at everything that man has made as a first draft. <laughs> that we have not yet eclipsed the threshold of human ingenuity and creativity in our designs. And there's a lot at stake if we destroy the planet. Biomimicry enables us to speak the evolutionary language and to integrate seamlessly with nature. And we need the brightest minds and we need the most passionate people to take on these challenges. Thank you.